Um, good evening. So today our, our topic is going to be ideals and sovereignty. And our case study is going to be how does the UK leaving the EU, or also known as Brexit, impact the state's sovereignty? Next slide. Uh, so key concepts. In global politics, we have seven um, main key concepts, such as sovereignty, reunification of sovereignty, power, intervention, peace, conflict, and interdependence. But we're going to be focusing on sovereignty. So in order to understand um, IGOs and how borders work, we need to understand sovereignty. And sovereignty, by definition, is the ability of a state to have its own independence, control over territory, and ability to govern itself. There are four main part, uh, main um, sovereignties, uh, such as domestic sovereignty, interdependent sovereignty, international legal sovereignty, and Westphalian sovereignty. Next slide. So IGOs and types of IGOs. So what is an IGO? An IGO is an intergovernmental organization composed primarily of sovereign states or of other intergovernmental organizations. So IGOs are established by a treaty that acts as a charter creating the group. And these treaties are formed when lawful representatives of several states go through a ratification process providing the IGOs of an international legal, legal personality. There are three main types of international organization, organizations, such as international non-governmental organization, multinational enterprises, and intergovernmental organizations. And RGPC is borders, which we're gonna be focusing on on the next slide. So on this next slide, we can see the logos of the most well-known IGOs around the world. Um, next slide. Um, so we have the United Nations or the UN, which is one of the largest and most well-known IGOs. So the United Nations is the, the intergovernmental organization that facilitates cooperation on international law, security, economic development, social progress, and human rights issues. Almost every recognized independent country is a member state. So the UN is divided into the General Assembly, the Security Council, the Economic and Social Council, Secretariat, and the International Court of Justice. So the UN um, deals with a lot of issues as predicted, um, such as the environment, the environment, human rights, education, gender, social justice, health, country, or region-specific policy, issues and statistics, some of them being even conflict between countries, um, which such involves even borders. So borders, um, next slide. So the European Union or the EU. So the European Union is a political and economic union of 27 member states that ensures the movement of people, goods, services, and capital. So uh, just like the UN, uh, the EU also faces a lot of issues such as immigration, terrorism, economic situation, unemployment, and finances. So the, in international law, sovereignty is the exercise of power by state. So this can become an issue of a special concern upon the failure of the usual expectations that de jure and de facto sovereignty exist at the same time in the same cases. So this is often uh, the sense given the term when they call for a return to national sovereignty of which the European Union is said to be deprived of their state of. So in this sense, sovereignty seems to be kind of like understood as freedom of the country, where they're not independent by external factors and that they can do whatever they want to do. So in simple terms, we can lay out a dominant model in which some see um, sovereignty as kind of defensive or a mean of protection to external threats, while others see it rather as a means to attract a certain external assets by transferring certain competences of the supranational level, which the EU does. But Mila is gonna also tell us how the Brexit or the uh, UK leaving the EU affected its sovereignty and the people. And now over to Ibrahim. All right, thank you for the great introduction. Uh, now we must learn about the IGO's applications in the sense that war and peace. And so what I mean by war and peace is that because war and peace studies take a big role in global politics and diplomacy, both major theories, liberalism and realism, um, that are like um, exist on opposite side of the spectrum, they agree that war and peace are crucial to be studied when analyzing the role of IGOs in different methods of analysis. However, the distinctions can be made, that is to say that the theories differ on the role of IGOs in limiting sovereignty and their pursuit, um, which is like the question that we are basing most of our analysis on. Next slide. Uh, yeah, what does realism think? And so realism has a very distinctive approach, uh, that is to say globalization and interdependence of the states at the global level have led to joint decision making in many issues indeed. However, even though they even though realism admits at that claim, they push to you the claim that each state tends to achieve its interests and a common way of decision making will lead to the fact that only the strongest states will are deciding in the name of it all. For example, an example uh, mentioned by uh, uh, IRA, the UN Security Council, a very important part 
of the UN has the veto power for the permanent state members. In the sense that these permanent members uh, are the strongest and they always push their agenda and they always decide on uh, most important matters. And so it will lead to presenting their national interest, the, maybe the national interest of France, national interest of China, and of the, those are the strongest ones as international. And this means that their sovereignty is still preserved. Next slide. Um, the levels of analysis from the point of view of realism. Three levels of analysis I'm gonna talk about. Firstly, the global level, secondly, regional, thirdly, national. Now, from the global level, you have the IGOs, uh, uh, the realism telling us that the IGOs do not have a lot of influence on international law, considering that it's being taken by consensus. Consensus being, uh, like it's, it's a definition for being taken by voting like in the Security Council. And so uh, even in, in the General Commission, like it's, it's, it's very similar, it, states votes on certain matters. And so states votes, not the UN. And so they still have their sovereignty intact. Secondly, on the regional aspect and the regional level, level of analysis, regions are still deciding uh, their agendas irrespective of IGOs. For example, oil rich countries like Saudi Arabia and like Qatar are still deciding their agenda um, in the region, that is to say the Gulf, the Arab Gulf region and the peninsula. And so uh, these oil rich countries decide their own agenda, irrespective of an IGO like the UN. Um, they don't, they don't, um, like they decide their own agenda, the UN doesn't impose anything on them. Thirdly, national level of analysis. States still have the ability to dictate law on their domestic agenda. That is to say inside of their borders. And so their borders are, are still intact, which is uh, uh, the GPC we discussed, uh, we're discussing. For example, China is still implementing the death penalty inside of their, uh, uh, well, inside of their borders. And that is to say, UN is completely against death the death penalty, yet China still implements it uh, successfully. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and how does liberalism think about this uh, war and peace issue? Well, liberalist uh, world view of world politics is a that of a high possibility of a state of peace. Liberalists indeed tend to think that in the pursuit of peace, the state is not unitary and cannot achieve peace alone. The state needs intergovernmental organizations to keep stability. Liberalists in this way take a, to take a step further to make the argument that in order to promote peace, cooperation, avoid conflict, um, there needs to be an increasing role of international organizations. And for this pursuit, states agree to organization of their power, uh, of their sovereignty could be considered their power as well. Um, and that is an important key concept. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and so I'm gonna talk about two claims, uh, actually popular claims, a claim by, made by liberalism and a counterclaim made by realism. And so the claim made by liberalism is that IGOs have a lot of power um, in the sense that over sovereignty of its states and laws, and so they're eroding sovereignty. That is to say, if the European Union adopts a law, for example, um, um, something related to uh, a law like regulating a, a certain company, all these, all of these uh, members of the European Union has to bind to this law. So this signals that the law is transborders and, and can override borders. The counterclaim by realism is that two responses. Firstly, states have to the right to withdraw and to preserve their sovereignty. For example, the UK, uh, uh, the Brexit issue is going to be uh, talked about thoroughly uh, in Mila, with Mila. Secondly, that most IGOs are based on consensus, as I mentioned before. In other words, states have the have a vote to make their rules, and states still have their sovereignty intact. Now we're going to talk about Brexit with Mila. Yes, thank you, Ibrahim. Let me just. OK, so with all that said, we will be looking at the specific case of the UK leaving the EU or what is known as Brexit. So on the 31st of January 2020, the United Kingdom left the European Union seven, 47 years after it joined, and the withdrawal agreement that was concluded with the EU entered into force. The transition period ends on the 31st of December 2020, and the UK will recover its economic and political independence. At least that's what the UK government claims. British debate about Brexit has been dominated by longing for restoring UK sovereignty, and pro-Brexit advocates want Britain to take back control from European Union governments and bureaucrats. So first, we need to keep in mind that there's a difference between sovereignty and autonomy. UK's autonomy depends more on the social, economic, and cultural interactions with the rest of the world than it does on the UK's government's political power. By having those interactions, the UK's government's and citizens' ability to make independent and limited 
decisions is eroded. And yes, the UK's membership in the EU does erode formal sovereignty. Sovereignty is intentionally eroded by economic, social, and cultural interrelationships. However, because Bilal, of- Sorry to interrupt, but 10 minutes have passed. Okay. However, because of all of the cooperative relationships that the UK has made across the English Channel, this membership in the European Union actually has enhanced rather than eroded effective UK autonomy. As Ibrahim mentioned, most IGOs are based on consensus and example states actually vote to make the rules. The British can legitimately argue that the, U the U EU government and the commissions have adopted excessive regulations, but none of those decisions were taken without UK participation. Also, US skeptics can also complain about unwanted immigration for Europe and the EU membership threatens UK culture and national identity. On one side, leaning towards European integration, a link towards European integration compromises effective autonomy, and on the other side, leaning towards UK autonomy compromises, compromises all the potential benefits that might be achievable through openness. All of the issues between the UK's relationship with the European Union should actually be transformed into an underlying goal to establish a combination of genuinely effective local autonomy and on a, and of beneficial integration with Europe. However, it would pose as highly unfortunate if most Brits were to favor Brexit just because of having this one elusive sovereignty. On the other hand, quite a lot of Brits are in favor of Brexit uh, because they say it's the only way that the UK can truly make the laws just in the UK. And if that is truly the kind of sovereignty that the UK wants, it will be quite difficult for to achieve it if the UK did not leave the EU. UK's Prime Minister Boris Johnson also pledged to use the UK's recaptured sovereignty to control immigration, create free ports, liberate the fishing industry, and in negotiate trade agreements. While all of that sounds promising and well planned out, what are some of the issues UK citizens might, might face? UK citizens may struggle with updated identity questions, as well as adopting their thinking and their behavior. The EU will, of course, continue to implement decisions, and this time the bad thing is that the UK will still be infected by those decisions, even though it is not part of the EU. They might take back control of immigration and restore back sovereignty, but at other times, home residents or Brits may experience some regrets. So what is the conclusion for all of this? So. We all know that the United Kingdom is inescapably a part of Europe and that changes the European Union will make will still affect UK, as we mentioned, whether it stays or it doesn't stay in the EU, which is not staying. The puzzle, given the already existing situation, is whether such sovereignty must operate at national level and that the life of the United Kingdom citizens will be changed. Thank you.